How many of you ready for the word? Um, have you guys recovered yet from me versus me? No. Are y'all <laughs> still in the space? Okay. We can do this together. We all we got. Me versus me was kind of intense, wasn't it? Um, how many of you got checked about creativity last week? Isn't that interesting? My brain has been literally flooded with ideas outside of my experience. And uh, I've just been trusting God and my presence and my quality time with God uh, to get brand new ideas. It's a powerful, unbreakable currency. Uh, let me say this about creativity before I give you my scripture today. You need to passionately believe God to deal with you about the weapon of procrastination. That's the only thing that's going to work against your creativity. If you don't allow, when creativity loses its edge because you procrastinate, the thing changes around you. So what was creative now is irritating. And if you don't catch it first, somebody else will. So a part of being creative is asking God to help you with your, the, the name of the demon is I'll do it later. And you've been, oh, I'll get to that. So you cannot prosper and procrastinate. I want you to hear that as a warning. It's by the Spirit of God. If you are a procrastinator, you are not stewarding the information God is giving you, okay? Um, we started a brand new revolutionary series this morning called The Road to Romans. And uh, as I was preaching it, I fought everything in me uh, to not have a breakdown and, and do backflips down these aisles. Uh, because it was so powerful to relearn the gospel. A part of what I said this morning was, in my studies, I'm feeling like I'm getting saved all over again uh, because I am renewing my mind to the gospel. So I'm going to catch you up to speed, but if you go home, I want you to watch uh, the replay. Um, and I also mentioned that because there are 16 chapters to the book of Romans, uh, I can't preach every chapter, so you're going to have to follow the reading plan. What I'll be doing is preaching the summation or the turning chapter of every segment of it um, and it's actually fascinating my wife and I were talking about it there's a lot of Christians who have never really committed to studying the book of Romans and it is so important that you make that decision to do so it will revolutionize your life um, a part of what I said that has ticked people off is that it might be beneficial for Christians to start reading the Bible with the story of Jesus and then learn the story of Moses. I think the way we get this wrong is that we learn Moses before we learn the Messiah. And so Moses subconsciously becomes our example. And then we got to unlearn that stuff when we get to the Messiah. If it makes you feel any better, study whoever came first. Moses ain't older than the Messiah. So I think you should dump yourself into Jesus so that you can learn how the rest of that makes sense. Does that make sense to you? Uh, and um, I say this to you prophetically. God is, God is relaying this foundation in this church because we are at the beginning of almost like a 50-year revamp of the way we approach Christianity. And a part of how we're going to start is by pioneering the real gospel. A part of what I introduced this morning is that the synoptic gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the gospels revealed. They are the gospel revealed. Everything Jesus did was the gospel. But the book of Romans is the gospel explained. The gospel is not explained in the gospels. They are revealed. The principle is this. You do not explain before you reveal. Something is revealed then it is explained. And so a lot of us have been studying the Gospels and we miss the Gospel because the Gospel is revealed in the Epistle of Paul to the Romans. That's point number one. Point number two is the mystery of the church is revealed in the book of Ephesians. So if we're going to be dutiful students of the Word of God, we've got to recommit ourselves to this to begin to meditate upon what the Gospel is and what it is not. And the reason this is important is because people are changed by the gospel they believe even if it's errant so if what you learn is wrong you become the wrong you learned just because you learned it that way does that make sense to you and in my I only basically know the church with a few exceptions and what I realized was that I had never really heard a quality gospel I heard stuff around it stuff implying it and the other crime is this in my search of the things of the spirit, I met apostles, and that mantle is responsible for the gospel, and they abandoned it. They abandoned it to teach all about gifts, to preach their movement, 
Nothing from that mantle is known for redeeming people from the curse of the law and bringing them into the fullness of the gospel. What we have tapped into is the one power that breaks men out of sin, and it's the goodness of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. A part of why people gasped this morning is because I told them that the Ten Commandments is not the gospel of Jesus. Y'all offended already, and I ain't even got there. Y'all done watch a little dumb movie. And watch that man come down with them butters, them grays down, and, and establish you a whole faith. And subconsciously, we live in a war between Moses and Jesus. Who's more important? Who said what? How do we live? Jesus played it so well when they tried to trap him up on this issue. Moses said that the greatest commandment is all of this. What do you say? And Jesus always answered them. I didn't come to destroy the law. I don't have to destroy it. I fulfilled it. If I'm the answer to the law, then there's no need to destroy it. I prove that I am the only way out of the law. So, you know, that's what we're learning. I'm going to Romans 4, all right? I have to, now this is going to be one of the messages that you got to actually think through, all right? I'm going to Ro Romans 4. Y'all ain't ready. Give me about 10 years and then I'm going to give y'all revelation. I I'm going to do the, a, a whole month on revelation right before I retire. Y'all ain't ready for it now. I'm going to hit Romans right now. Y'all can't, if, if, if I take Revelation from y'all, y'all going to leave, y'all just going to be like, uh-uh, it's gone. Ain't Maybell told me that man was a warlock. I know. I'm going to leave it alone, but, but right now we're going to go to Romans. And I'm reading this in the living Bible, the living Bible, so that you can understand it, okay? I had not realized, I told EP, if we had the time to do a creative component, I would do an AA group, a support group for people who were legalists. You don't even realize that 80% of you are addicted to the law. And, and I'm going to prove it to you. When I start preaching this stuff, that thing is going to come up and you're like, no, nope, no, nope, uh-uh, no, nope, that ain't what my Bible say. It's the wages of sin. But you tell me how that's the good news. Preaching the cost of sin is not preaching the good news. There you go. You see that feeling right there? Y'all like, where are you going with this young man, huh? Holiness is right. It is. But you're not getting there without the grace of God. Romans 4, verse 1, in the living Bible. This is going to help you. And the smoke is going to come in, okay? Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What were his experiences concerning this question of being saved by faith? Was it because of his good deeds that God accepted him? If so, then he would have had something to boast about. I bless your name. But from God's point of view, Abraham had no basis at all for pride. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and that is why God canceled his sins and declared him what? I can't hear you. Declared him what? But, he, but didn't he earn his right to heaven by the good things he did? This is so good. No, for being saved is a gift. If a person could earn it by being good, then it wouldn't be free, but it is. It is given to those who do not work for it. For God declares sinners to be good in his sight if they have faith in Christ to save them from God's wrath. King David spoke of this, describing the happiness of an undeserving sinner who is declared what? Guilty. What is wrong with you? What? Not guilty. Not guilty by God. Verse 7 says, blessed and to be envied, he said, are those whose sins are forgiven and put out of his sight. Verse 8, yes, what joy there is for anyone whose sins are no longer counted against him by the Lord. Now the question is this, is this blessing, y'all scared to even read it, given only to those who have faith in Christ but also keep the law? Or is the blessing also given to those who do not keep the Jewish rules but only trust in Christ? Well, what about Abraham? 
we say that he received these blessings through his faith. Was it by faith alone or because he kept the law? For the answer to that question is this one. When did God give this blessing to Abraham? It was before he became a Jew. Before he went through the Jewish initiation ceremony of circumcision. It wasn't until later on after God had promised to bless him because of his faith that he was circumcised. The circumcision ceremony was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him just and good in his side before the ceremony. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who believe and are saved without obeying Jewish laws. We see then that those who do not keep these rules are justified by God through faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those Jews who have been circumcised. They can see from his, from his example that it is not the ceremony that saves them. For Abraham found favor with God by faith alone. Before he was circumcised. Two more verses and I'm going to leave you alone. It is clear then that God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was not because Abraham obeyed God's laws, but because he trusted God to keep his promise. So if you still claim that God's blessings go to those who are good enough, then you are saying that God's promises to those who have faith are meaningless and faith is foolish. Can I just end it with this? But the fact of the matter is this. When we try to gain God's blessing and salvation by keeping his laws, we always end up under his anger. For we always fail to keep them. The only way we can keep from breaking laws is to not have any to break. And the word of the Lord is already blessed. The name of this message is I can't get good enough. I want you to write that down. Come on, come on, open your heart, your religious self. I can't get good enough. The structure, again, of the book of Romans is this. Chapters 1 through 9 is the Apostle Paul writing and distinguishing what the law is, what the law is not. 9 through 11 is about distinguishing God's relationship with Jew and Gentile, Israel and the church. 11 through 15 is how to apply what was revealed in 1 through 11. It's the practical part of the book. Chapter 16 is simply him saying bye-bye and saying greetings to all of the personal people he was writing to from Corinth at Rome. He gives the entire purpose of the book of Romans in Romans, the first chapter, when he says he is an apostle and a slave and his job, not his message, but his work was the gospel. That means he understood that a large part of his work was to do the good news. Doesn't your scripture say that we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only so now that brings us into some real meaty suggestions because I was never taught how to do the gospel did you hear what I just told I was never taught how to do the gospel and when you talk about doing the gospel it's not just talking about doing good deeds a part of what Jesus did you, re you ready for me is relieve people from the curse of effort. Right now, those kittens that are fighting in your stomach are the years and years of religious lies because people preached the Old Testament prophets as if they were the gospel. When we come into the book of Romans, a part of what we learned is your efforts are noble but not good enough. 
we learn the principle called the full depravity of the human experience through the book of Romans. And what that is is the writer uses the entire book to show you how wicked humans can be. You find some real crazy sin depth in the book of Romans, right? But then a part of what you see is that there is a reiteration that the whole point of the law was to show you could not fulfill it. That was the whole point and the purpose of the laws of Moses. It was a measuring rod against the wickedness of humanity. That's one level of mental breakthrough you're going to have to need. Do you know the harder one you're going to have to need? Proving to yourself that nothing you can do can make you earn righteousness. That, ooh -wee. Now I know, now listen. And it is not that your fasting is disrespected. It is not that your prayer life is disrespected. It is not that your praise and your dance and your worship and your consecration. It is not that they are meaningless. It means that if you do it or don't, God does not change his view of you. And the problem with you and the motive behind your prayer life is you're trying to fight for acceptance. And the motive be behind your fasting is you're trying to be on good terms with God. But you were on good terms with God after Calvary. I just need 20 of you to get this. I want you to see the danger that we've been preaching into you. If we preach to you that you can get good enough, the basis of your walk with God is personal achievement. And this scripture says that Abraham was counted righteous not because of anything did. And in God's eyes, the verse said, Abram had no basis for pride. Have you ever seen a religious person be proud of how much they pray? and condemn others that they pray every day. You can't touch my prayer life. And the sense of egotism that comes when you do personal piety to feel better than somebody else. But the way Paul wrote this up is he even the whole joint. He like, yeah, if you obey the law, cool. If you don't obey the law, cool. The issue is sin and repentance and the issue is faith in Jesus Christ so that nobody can boast. I want to know if the way your mama and daddy and bishop raised you got you in performance with God. I want to know if your competitive character and the fact that they only say they're proud of you when you do good and when you accomplish, I want to know if that's the reason behind your legalism. It's okay to be competitive in your career and in your degree and in your ambitions, but it is not okay to take that into your relationship with God. Who and what are you competing against? We are saved by faith. And here is the revolution. The revolution is this. We use faith for housing and faith for cars and faith for miracles and faith for blessings we even use faith to prophesy but when it gets to salvation and when it gets to righteousness we would rather much earn it than have it by faith everything else you understand you understand from faith except righteousness that is the most devastating truth of this book you gotta sit in the truth that that righteousness is by faith and that feels really bad but how else do you get everything you get from God name one gift you got that you deserve name one ability you got that you earned did you score right to be anointed did you score right to deserve the Holy Ghost did you score right no why do you think being good enough is what makes you righteous. Why do you work and hustle to try to alter God's view about you? Maybe if I do more of this, he'll do more of that. But then when you do that, what you imply is he is a menopausal, inconsistent, double-minded, moody, unstable creature. When the man said, I am God, I change not, he literally means I only got one mood and his holiness. I do what I want to do when I want to do it and nothing you going to do going to make me not do what I already said I want was going to do shout hallelujah slap somebody and tell them you can't change him we have been preaching a manipulative gospel do more of this so he can do more of that be more like this so he can be more like that but nothing you are in your flesh is going to dictate what the sovereign does 
you still don't believe me. I will, son. Listen. In this same scripture, when we are referring to Abram, he is talking about how Abram got called who he was called to be. And the Bible said that Abram was a Jew before he was circumcised. That means that God looked at Abram and saw him as who he was always going to be. The ceremony came after the obedience because the issue was faith, not the culture. The issue was who he believed in, not the law he obeyed. Paul kept reiterating this, Dr. Pam, because the Romans were acting just like you act. And they're like, no, you're not going to tell me my neighbors is a Jew. My grandmama was a Jew, and I came up in church. I know all of this. And Paul said, let me break it down to you like this. You don't have it in you to please God. Slap somebody say, I can't get good enough. Now, that don't mean... That don't mean you got to sin. What he says is in me. You don't believe this. Paul said in me, in my flesh, comma, there is no good thing. Even on your best day, you still stink. Even on your best day, your most holy day, your most non-horny day, your most non-gambling day, your, real, your filthiness is still like a rag before God. So then he gives us how to be righteous. And this is what he says, Benny. For it is written, I'm about to clean cartwheel right over you, that the just, that the just, that the just, now the reason why y'all not shouting is because you didn't see 8 o'clock. We did some investigation, baby. I found out to be righteous is to be filled with justice. Righteousness and justice is the same word. So what the scripture is saying that the just or the righteous don't live by what they do well. The just shall live by, why don't you scream back at me? That the just shall live not by being good enough, but the just live by that. You don't believe me? Go to Romans 12. Whatever. Whatever including your personal righteousness and efforts. Romans 12 says whatever is not from faith is sin. So if you could get your righteousness by your own works, it would still end up as sin because it was filled with your effort and it disrespects the sacrifice. You did nothing. I'm about to run. You did nothing. You did not die to convince the man on the cross. You, you did nothing to get him out to grave. Sorry. You did nothing to get the Holy Spirit to roll the stone away. It had nothing to do with you. He was fully and conscious of everything wrong with you from before the foundations of the world. But the reason he ain't mad, watch me, Jerry, because he didn't see you as you. He saw you hidden in him. Your Bible says you were in Christ, in God, from before the beginning. Your mistakes were necessary to show you how miserable you would be if you don't live by faith. Shout hallelujah. You can't get good enough. That's devastating. That's devastating. I feel personally offended, Junior. I've been living half my life, half my ministry, trying to use my obedience to manipulate the man. Storms come and I'm like, why me? I've done this, I've done that. You mean to tell me 19 nations and you gonna let this happen? When the whole principle is, whether it was 19 nations or your neighbor, whatever I've decided to do, I have already decided to do and I am not a respecter of persons. You cannot compete your way into the blessing of the Lord. You athletic your way into favor with God. It's by faith or it's by nothing. The millions of people around the world that are in sin and they stop whatever their issue is and they're like, alright, this is it. I'm about to go on a 199 day fast. I'm about to, I'm about to starve this lust away. I'm about to starve this depression away. No, devil, I'm going to turn my plate over. The problem is, if that is not done in faith, 
and you fasted from a place of your effort maybe what I can do for me can fix me you might as well go to the nearest Krispy Kreme and fill yourself up with calories even when you fast you got to fast in faith maybe there's a help or maybe it won't but at the end of the day I know it's not about me I know what I live is a life of faith and faith alone now this is controversial but it is an error in most of our doctrine because we, we're naive. When we join churches and come to Jesus, we do so on the basis of what we're not and what we need. So when we join, nobody tells us what we already have before we do what's right. You are more aware of your need than you are your inheritance. The promise of God was predetermined. I show you a mystery. If what I say is true and the synoptic gospels is Jesus doing the gospel that would later be explained in the book of Romans, then it makes perfect sense. God sent his only begotten son. Perceive this. In the likeness of sinful flesh and in the flesh, Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus had the same flesh that you do. And your disbelief about that is why you're not following his pattern on how to be sinless. You think that he has something extra that kept him away from temptation. He came to the world as our example on how to live without sin. It can be done. He, and if it couldn't be done, then he wouldn't have been tempted. The mystery is this. <laughs> he's baptized. He comes out. John, John, he's done no miracles. He's turned no water into wine. He's cast out no devils yet. He had not gone anywhere. He ain't had Hosanna. Peter ain't said thou art the Christ. He's done nothing. He's done nothing. The only thing he's done, look at what the Bible says. When he gets to John to ask John to baptize him. Look at the mystery, John. No. John the Baptist says, why? Jesus says, I need to do this that all righteousness. I'm showing you the gospel incarnate. I need to be baptized that all righteousness may be fulfilled. He comes out and here goes the doctrine of justification. Once he gets out without doing anything, God says this, oh God, you missed it. This is my miracle worker, great person, healthy person, sinless person. This is my son. Hallelujah. He ain't done nothing yet, but he's mine. I made provision for whatever he's going to do, but it needs to be known at the top of the day, this kid is mine. The yeah, Amonique, that ain't good enough. Not only did he own Jesus before Jesus could do right or wrong, he said that he was pleased with him. You don't read your Bible. This is my son and I'm pleased. What did Jesus do? that was different from the rest of the Jews from the time he was 1 to 30. He did exactly what they did. So where was the pleasure of God in Jesus' desire to fulfill righteousness? His obedience to the will of God. This is the gospel. When you preach and teach this type of gospel, it makes religious people angry because they love to preach you can be holy enough to earn it. It gives them a sense of personal life achievement. I've been celibate 28 years. <laughs> now, I'm not disrespecting it. I'm saying it's sad. It's sad that we preach that the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost of God, is the greatest gift on the planet. Okay, this is how this works. The gift of the Father is the Son. The father goes in his mind, and in his culture, they give gifts when they introduce themselves. 
So the gift of the Father is the Son, but the gift of the Son is the Spirit. The greatest thing Jesus could have left on earth was not the books of the prophets. Y'all had that. This is why he said, it is a benefit that I leave you because you can't get the reason I came. It is more beneficial to you that I go so that I can give you the gift of the Spirit. And when the helper is come, he's going to lead you. Hey, hey. He's going to guide you into every truth. I love that. And then that's not only the thing he's going to do. The reason why he's leading you into all truth is because deception is aimed at the future. So he's delivering you into all truth because he wants to show you what must come to pass. Now you don't understand that. There are two biblical words, okay? Alos, okay? Here is what it means. If I give you, this is the word another in the Bible, alos, okay? If I give you a carnation <laughs> and I give you a rose, you have two flowers that are different. That's the biblical word that means another of a different kind. It's where we get the biblical term male and female opposite, okay? But then there's another biblical word that means another of the same kind. If I give you a rose and then I give you a rose, I've not allosed you. I've given you a rose that is the same. Jesus says about the spirit, I'm sending you a helper, another of the same kind. What he's saying is I'm giving you me without the limitation of my body. And look at the gospel. I'm going to give it to you. They don't believe it. But then in Acts chapter 2, because you don't get the Holy Ghost by deserving the Holy Ghost. I appreciate how long you stay at that altar frothing. You didn't deserve that. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, in the last day, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon holy flesh, upon Baptist flesh, upon captive flesh. I'm going to give it to everybody. The young and the old, the rich and the poor, the Jew and the Gentile, the son and the daughter, on all flesh. If that ain't the gospel, I don't know what is. He told them, I'm going to pour it out on your handmaidens. How good do you think they were? I'm going to give it to everybody. The pride that drives the religious spirit is that people think they earn their salvation. Now, if you tarry for the Holy Ghost, God bless you. I'm not making fun of you because for some people it works, particularly the people that don't think they can receive it. So if that's what you need to do and work to convince God, come on. Get, and you know, it's so sad. I don't want to laugh at it because it really is devastating. When I watch people who desperately want to be filled with the Holy Ghost be told by some Christian they're not ready. Go on back, baby. And these idiots <laughs> actually preach that to alienate the rest of the people that didn't get it that way. They say, so I got it the old time way. Well, that makes you a fool. I didn't have to work for it. I didn't work for nothing else. All I did is say, yes, Lord, I want it. And I received it not by clapping, but by faith. I received it not by not convincing him, but by faith. Look at what the Bible says. God considered Abraham righteous because he had no basis for pride. If the way I receive the Holy Ghost can fill me with pride, then maybe God ain't pleased with how I got it. That's not a trophy in your life. Why are you proud about the fact that you work like a slave for something it took Jesus one day to get on the earth? Why are you proud about that? Why are you boastful and arrogant about getting it that way? That's why you got to work for everything else you get. Because you are steeped in legalism. Call me ignorant, radical, disrespectful. I believe that a person could walk in here right now. I really do. Leave my church, go around the corner, I don't care. I believe a person could come in right now high off a of molly hung over and if they hear if they hear the word and receive it in faith and come to me and say I want the Holy Ghost I'm not turning him around and say now go fast and come back I'm going to say come on open your mouth he 
He's coming in on a glad heart. Tell him, thank you. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to make him wait. I'm going to make him receive it. Yeah. Shout hallelujah. Woo. The Holy Ghost is not my property. I don't own him to decide who gets him. The last person in the book of Acts that thought that they could buy the Holy Ghost, the apostle said, your money is going to hell with you. This is a free gift, and it's not up to you to make people earn what I paid for. Religion keeps trying to refund it. When the Bible say all flesh, he means all flesh. Somebody coming here staggering like a drunk man, and you Christians get nervous, and if he get convicted under the word and wants the spirit of God, I'm going to move you out the way. You and your self-righteousness, and I'm going to respond to his childlike faith. He don't know no better. So what? Sometimes that's how you got to get it. Maybe being drunk is going to help you get this thing. And when you sober up, the spirit of God will still be in there. I hadn't realized until I got close to God how much he didn't need my effort. <laughs> what he wants is my submission. But he does not need my effort. The reason this is so hard is because we've lived lives in families and in churches that determine their acceptance by our performance. And so it reinforces this sick theology that we can manipulate God into wanting us more. How much more can you want somebody than to die for them? If I literally die for you, how much more is it going to take? You cannot manipulate your way into good standing with God. If your young people heard this, if you learned it 20 years ago, you could have got half the stuff accomplished in a short amount of time because the devil had you studying how good you had to be for God's hand to come upon you. But if you can earn it, it ain't grace. If you can earn it, it ain't faith. With as good as your record is, it's still not good enough. I've been doing good. I cussed in 20 whole days. I say this to you as a prophet of God. There are, there are even charismatics that are full-fledged legalists. <laughs> Dreadlocks are demonic. Men can't preach with earrings. They ain't saved because... Because there's a jury department in heaven like, that's inappropriate, young man. Can't come here with that on. Now, if you have a cultural preference, fine. When in Rome, do was the Romans. Paul was not a legalist. He's like, yo, when I'm with them, I do what it takes to not offend them. But I'm not under what they under. If it's good for you and that's what makes you feel good, fine. I'll adapt so you can receive me. But I'm not under what you're under. People have wrong doctrines, and because of it, they cannot be convicted unto change. We've been steeped in decades of legalism and, 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 and erroneous approaches to the gospel that's got us somewhere thinking you can get good enough to deserve this. You can get good enough to be called. You can perform your way into a purpose. If you act good and be a good little boy, then God's going to not be God and decide, I've had a change of heart. Maybe you no longer to deserve to be consequential. No, the goodness of God does not move. He's made a decision. He's not changed his mind. If he could change his mind, it means he can be imperfect. What God do you believe? That your emotional status, your financial status, your career status, or your relationship with yourself can change what he thinks about you. It's not there. Now, can you die and go to hell just for those of you that's waiting for me to say it? I know you're in there like, you better say something about the wages. Of, you better come on now. 
Yes, okay, you can die and go to hell. Yes, you can. But that ain't the good news. That's actually the tragedy. Are we preaching the good news or the crisis? Are we preaching the gospel or the tragedy? The odd thing about most legalists is that they're full of sin. That's the, that's the funny part. Old, young, all white and otherwise. If you look in them hearts, they are bitter. They are angry. They are resentful, filled with judgment, proud, stubborn, boastful, arrogant. They just do a better job at hiding it. That's my prayer for you. If you get this and get delivered from performance anxiety and just sit in the goodness of God, then you're not shocked when you wake up and he says, my mercies are new. If you screwed up yesterday, it's Tuesday. <laughs> Good morning. I'm going to give you a brand new dose of grace. I'm more committed to you getting it together than faking it. And I want you to start taking this one victory at a time. Don't push, push yourself into performance to make religious people understand you. Take it one day at a time. And it's going to be a while to work this truth in you. But let it work. Yes, you were divorced, but I'm still good. Yes, you were betrayed, but I'm still good. I know you disobeyed me, but I'm still good. This is not pity pat or tic-tac-toe. I don't give you what you give me. That would make me God. May you come out of the power of a backwards gospel. People hear this and they're like, well, what about sin? Please say something about sin. The devastating thing about this is people stay away from God altogether because none of this has been clarified. So in their mind, look at the pride, according to our scripture, in their mind, let me get myself together. And then when I'm good enough, I'll go to God. <laughs> Do you know what that says to God? I got good without you. I did this. I came out of depression. I let go of this relationship. I did it. Now I'm ready for you. Help me be gooder. <laughs> then you go into a rat race of goodness, self-righteousness. I'm in a great season. The anointing is increasing because I've been speaking in tongues a lot more. Listen. <laughs> Appreciate your tongues, but that don't change how God feels about you no more than he does a, a, a person all around the world that's never heard him yet. The same agony that he feels over you, he feels about them. This is the Jew-Gentile confusion, and we don't see it in this context. Look at it in denominational conflict. Who thinks they're better than who or we got the right way? And some of them actually make you chant it. We are the way. We are the way. No, fool. Jesus is the way. You ain't the way nothing, creep. Jesus is the way. He's the truth. And he's the lie. In the book of Romans, Mike, it says, and let God be true. I wish I had help. Let God be true. Let God be true. Make a decision that he's true and everybody else is a lie. And you can be a lie saying the right stuff. Why do you get so much joy out of putting people in hell? Why does it make you feel like you're powerful? I believe in holiness. I believe in deliverance. I believe in sinless living. My resolve is we have not taught you how to get there and bullied you for not being there. We've cried holiness or hell, but we've not said how. You don't get to holiness by always doing it right. 
You don't get to holiness by making a list of what not to do. Do you know how you walk out of sin? You walk to Jesus. And what happens is the more you pursue him and the closer you get to him, beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall become. But we know this, that when we see him, we will be like him. For we have seen him, good googly muggly, as he is. You study sin, you become sinful. But you become what you behold. That's how your appetites change. Don't go out here, smoke a blunt, say, my apostle, cool. He know that this is natural. It come from the earth. No, listen. You let the universe send you off all you want to. What I'm telling you is to change your focus and pull your life off of a scoreboard of tally points of how many days you get it right. Look at the pride. You pray Monday, forget Tuesday, you like, oh, uh, Jesus. <laughs> Y'all laughing because you know it's true. You be like, I was doing good. And now, look, because you condemned, that is the character of Satan. So he's going to use that moment of condemnation to prevent you from doing it. But what sick person runs away from the doctor when you realize you're sick you're supposed to run after the savior condemnation makes you reject who you really need when you come back to God out of a week a bad week he's not like and where you been see some of y'all got a Tony Braxton love should have brought you home you home last night you should have been with me should have been right, 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 right. Oh, baby. No, he is not sitting up like a desperate mistress mad at you for not coming home. He is not sitting up in his gown like, and where were you last night? No, he is sitting there with loving arms. As a matter of fact, David said, if you make your bed in hell, if you leave me, I'll come to find you. He'll knock down the door like Hudson and say, you're going to love me. He's coming to get you, coming to get you, coming to get you. Shout hallelujah. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. I wish I had help. It's, I shall follow me. Not on the good days. Not on the holy days, not on the confident days, not on the victorious days. It's going to follow me whether I'm right or wrong because I'm his. I ain't got no control over what he thinks about me. If you mad because he loved me, take it up with him. Slap somebody, say I'm his. He ain't like your natural daddy. He's not waiting to cheer you on when you beat the other people. He don't care if you fall, if you rise. He's sitting there all the time. And it's going to take you a while to meditate in this because this is opposite of everything I heard. I was taught, boy, if you want the anointing, you got to get in there. You got to travail. I am. Now do it harder. Travail. Lady, I'm trying. No, I, it's in your belly. Travail. You finally feel something and you like man I did that I did that I know what's on me cuz I, I, I got it and I think the Lord is sitting there looking at you just like you still don't get it you're not righteous because of you you're not holy because of you you're not healthy because of you you're not sane because of you all of that comes because of who you believe. It's a simple principle. Getting you to believe that everything else comes by faith is easy. If you get a cell phone bill that you can't pay and I say have the faith, you're like, you're right about that. Increase my faith. But if I tell you you're saved, holy, and righteous by faith, you have a theological problem with that. You're like, no, that's not true. 
everything that happens in the kingdom happens by faith. How would you act if I told you you were condemned for no reason? Your sin is not more expensive than the blood. Now, if that ain't a good place to buck, if that ain't a good place to have an attack, if that ain't a good place to get the victory there, I just told you whatever you did, he already budgeted for it. He bankrupt heaven to make sure there was enough blood for you. Hey, 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 and enough blood for you, and enough, oh, and enough blood for you, and enough blood for you, and enough blood for you. Got some for you, a little more for you. There's blood for everybody. You get some blood. 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 Buckets and buckets of it. Plenty of it. A fountain for it. There is a fountain drawn from Emmanuel's but Sinners can punch beneath the flood and lose all. Woo! Lose all. I dare you to take 30 seconds and just go crazy and praise in here. I go crazy right there. Come on, go crazy. I ain't got to be good enough. If you're going to bless me, you're going to bless me. If you're going to use me, you're going to use me. I'm not going to try to move your hand with my resume. I'm just going to yield. I'm just going to yield. Come on, praise him a little harder. Woo! ay 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 I feel God delivering you from the spirit of rejection, from the spirit of abandonment. You don't have to ever perform for me. We can just chill. Come on. He just wants to be with you. He just wants to be with you. Oh, come on. Praise him, Zion. Come on. Praise him, Zion. This is our gospel. This is our gospel. This is our gospel. This is our gospel. I don't, <laughs> I ain't got to be good enough. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus in trying to get people how to not bring legalism and their effort into prayer. He teaches them and he says this concerning prayer. He says, whatever you have need of, if you ask it in my name, not yours, I'll do it. Whatsoever you ask in my name, I'll do it because of me, not because of you. The next verse says this. This is the gospel, Ricky, because this is the conflict. Your fathers, referring to Old Testament Israel, your fathers did what they could, and they were evil. He said, if you ask them for bread, even in their wickedness, they're not going to give you a serpent stone. That's not what makes me shout. The next verse says, how much more? <laughs> Hallelujah! He said, how much more? If you ask me for something, am I not going to give you? Take no thought. I could run around here over what you shall wear for tomorrow. For your father knows what you have need of. Even before you ask, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. I used to, Maddie, when I came up, my granddaddy and them realized I could sing a little bit. I would get up and sing His Eyes on a Sparrow. Why should I feel? I didn't know what I was talking about. First of all, I didn't even know what a sparrow was. Number one, I'm like, I guess, yeah. And I know he watches me. I sing, you know, I did that. I saw that same little sparrow in the context of Jesus talking about prayer and provision. 
I'm trying to preach this to you because some of you even think you can be good enough for him to provide. In your mind, you think the reason you don't have is because you're not doing something right. Jesus told his disciples, look at this little sparrow. That's where the song came from. He said he's got everything he needs. Then he turned to his parents and said, are you not worth more than Tweety Bird right here? You want to praise him because if his eye is on the sparrow, I ain't got no help. I said if his eye is on the sparrow, if his eye is on the sparrow, he knows exactly what you need. Hey, how glory! It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I'm done. <laughs> Woo. Woo. <laughs> All right, devil, sorry to be you. You should have got us when you could. We've been free now. And you will know the truth. I used to believe this garbage. But the Bible say you will know the truth. And the truth will free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. I'm free at last. Come on, Zion. Shout hallelujah. You're not. You're not going to. God bless you. Nothing that God wants to do from you is going to change because you get better. Should you change? Yes. Should you repent? Absolutely. But you ain't got to be good enough to deserve what he planned for you. I'm trying to let this go, Sam. I'm under arrest. He chose your calling, knowing you. He chose your assignment, knowing you. He decided your birthday, knowing you. You can't shock the man. He fashioned you. He knows your cavities. He knows your weaknesses. The very hairs on your head are numbered. Everything that he's going to do for you, he's going to do it because he's in the mood for it. He's going to do it because he's just good. It's just his personality. I'm here to tell you rejoice. The purpose of God, the promise for God is still in full effect. Effective immediately. When you, when you come from under performance anxiety, prayer will be joyful for you. You don't go in prayer like you clocking off something on a, on a work list. You start being excited like, yo, I ain't got nothing to prove to you. You're the one person in my space that I don't have to prove myself to. You see me. You know me. My risings, my falling, every thought in my mind, you already know it. If I can bring my whole self. I can be fully present when I'm with you. Because nothing that I can do can push you off of me. Stop rejecting him with your effort. Let him in. He's delighted to show you mercy. <laughs> when you cross into the second segment of Romans, in Romans 8, there's this long list of stuff that can't separate you <laughs> from the love of God. That is our gospel. Heights, depths, light, darkness, nothing. You don't have to be good enough. And as long as you think you do, you enter into a rat race of performance, trying to earn God's acceptance, his love, his decisions. I want you to lift your hands all over this building. <laughs> and I want, I want this truth to hit you so hard 
until you pull yourself out of that orphan thinking, out of that orphan lens. Come on, worship him all over this building. Come on, come on, lift, your, lift the fruit of your lips. Come on, some people don't worship because they don't think God listens to it. No, he still hears you. Come on, lift your voice and worship him all over this building. Come on, turn the volume up on your heart and worship him. Come on, worship him. Come on, worship him, all nations. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we love you because you first, you first loved us. Hallelujah. Come on, give him some glory. 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 He is more than deserving of it. Come on, magnify him. I am fully persuaded. Come on, magnify him. I'm not perfect, but I'm yours. I don't always get it right, but I'm yours. You've chosen me. There's nothing I could have done to deserve it. Some of you are in your mind like, this is just hard to believe. I want you to, I challenge you, just choose to receive it. I would rather live there than live under fear of not having it. Just choose. I choose to believe it. Uh, I bless you, Spirit of God. Hold the hand of the person next to you. And I want you to squeeze that hand as tight as you can. Father, I make intercession for the hand of the person I'm holding. My sister, my brother, whose faith is under attack, whose, whose identity is in question. My sister, my brother, who is not certain about what's next. I make intercession for them. And I'm praying, Spirit of God, that you would liberate them from the power of religious deception that's got them believing like they have to be an athlete before you or an entertainer before you or an actor before you. But Lord, your word declares that you want truth in the inward parts. Holy Spirit of God, as I hold the hand of my neighbor, I'm asking that you would brand this word in their hearts. Brand this word in their mind. Put this confession in their tongue that every lie they've ever believed about who you are and how you are. They've heard your words, but now reveal your ways. Begin to show them that you are not inconsistent hallelujah begin to reveal to them beginning tomorrow morning uh, that you cannot change your mind uh, help them to see that you are the only one capable uh, of delivering them from deep waters uh, help them to see that you are the only one strong enough uh, to open the way before them uh, as I grab this hand right now uh, I'm believing that the word of truth uh, will begin to reverse every judgment that they've ever believed about not being good enough. Hallelujah. Begin to reverse the bands of wickedness that have operated in their conscious self about needing to deserve to be a son or needing to deserve to be a daughter. And right now by the law of agreement we route out of their hearts that competitive technique, that competitive hardware that's got them trying to move your hand because of what they do and right now I agree with whatever the spirit of God is trying to teach my brother and my sister concerning what you want from them you spirit of tradition and religious legalism and deception that's got my sister and got my brother trying to compete for love and compete for for affection and compete for acceptance we expose you right now with the light of the word of God we turn the light on you 
and we declare you are a liar you are a liar the love of God has lifted them hey the love of God has sustained them the love of God has raised them the love of God has preserved them the love of God has strengthened them the love of God has made them whole the love of God has delivered them the love of God has protected them from the fiery darts of the enemy the love of God plucked them out of sinking sand and set them upon the rock of ages now in the name of God's Christ I pray like Moses prayed hide us in the cleft of the rock don't allow us to become overwhelmed my God with what we know about ourselves oh wretched man that I am who can deliver me from this sinless death for you are God and you deliver us daily and you daily load us with benefits this is why we can declare our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our Deliver us, deliver us from evil. Help us to forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive our debtors. Yes, we can pray because you love us. We can pray because you see us. We can pray and go before the throne boldly to obtain help in our time of need. And it's not because of us. It's because of you, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So we thank you that our praise is more important than rocks, and we cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name. He has justified us. Let that hand go and praise him. For whom he also called, he also justified. I said for whom he also called, hey, he also justified. Ah, If he called you, he's going to justify you. You are righteous because he said so. Just feel gratitude. I'm trying to let it go. We thank you, Savior. And who you justify, you also qualify. Who you justify, you also qualify. I call you qualified. I said I call you qualified. Hey, hey, hey! Hey, 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 hey! 
help me, 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 help